So I think we should probably take our medicine first, shouldn't we? The amount of time we've spent together trying to pin down what working class means and all the usual well-intentioned nonsense, much of it coming from me about knowing which knife and fork to use or whether you say working class or working class, whether your parents went to university, whether you went to university, whether in fact it's just a socioeconomic status issue, which is usually what it boils down to. I now know exactly, I think, what Keir Starmer meant and I can't quite believe the clarity that he has provided. He is using working class in this context as the opposite of entitlement. That's it. That's all it is. So the right wing use it as a synonym for racist now. They talk about the elites are ignoring working class concerns and immigration is out of control. Sort of just neatly glossing over things like Cable Street or, uh, or the very simple notion of, of, of solidarity. The left have used it uh, in, in very nebulous terms, I think. What is, what is the working class? But he's pinning it down to a place that I haven't really seen it through before. I think, and I'll play that again, because for Keir Starmer, that was pretty rousing, wasn't it? And, and, and the way the crescendo of applause built up in the room, it was old-fashioned oratory. And he is not an orator. He, he, you know, I have an exchange with my mate Johnny Vaughan and I have brilliant conversations about politics. Johnny's a genius. If, if you're not familiar with his, um, uh, his deep thinking, then do listen to his appearance on, on my Full Disclosure podcast. But he sends me these texts, and I look at them, and I think, what's he on about now? And then I think, crikey, yeah, he's right. He's really intrigued at the moment by the importance of oratorical quality, not by what is being said, but by the importance to voters of how it is being said. My position is a little bit... Um, a little bit fence sitting it's 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 kind of well of course it shouldn't matter but it does <laughs> and and that's that's the bottom line but there Starmer came the closest he's come I think in all the years that we've been watching him to uh, setting setting a room alight and interesting that he went in on class now he would be particularly conscious of this it occurred to me yesterday listening to it because the school he went to became fee paying while he was there I think although the children the boys that were already there were not required to pay fees is that right did it become fee paying while he was already there or did it become a grammar school while he was already there I forget the details but that's such an imposition of hierarchy in a space where it hadn't previously existed that I, I suspect that that was pretty formative and then he tells a, a remarkable story about his parents turning up at Buckingham Palace, presumably for his knighthood or for, for, for some ennoblement that he was about to receive. And they turned up with their Great Danes in the car. And obviously there's not any uh, infrastructure in place at Buckingham Palace for people turning up in an old estate car with, with I think, two Great Dane dogs in the back. His, his, his mum, his late mother, was a huge animal carer i don't know what the word is she even had a donkey sanctuary in a, in a in a in a field behind the house and as she became more disabled as she got older the one of her great pleasures he told me was to sit in that in the window just looking at the donkeys but he told that he tells that story with a, a, a perhaps a degree of deprecation because there's embarrassment so he loved it and he was proud but there's embarrassment attached you know if you if you're at a party and your parents are the only ones there that haven't put on the right clothes as a child, you feel a cringe, right? You feel a sense of cringe, I imagine. It's never quite happened to me. But certainly having quite broad Yorkshire accents was, was, was rare at my posh school. So I think he's talking about entitlement, isn't he? There's no real mystery of what he means when he says that. Or when we say it. So if you have a sense of entitlement, you often don't know what it is. There's that wonderful line about privilege, which I think is the... The bedfellow of entitlement, isn't it? And and if you've spent your whole life enjoying privilege, then equality feels like oppression, and that I think explains the the editorial policies of uh, the Daily Telegraph and and much of the rest of the media. It's why their obsession with diversity or Black Lives Matter or whatever it may be. They're being told that you have to be a uh, we have, to have a, we have to work a little bit harder to make things fairer. And if you benefit enormously from the unfairness, and you've never actually acknowledged that, because, to be fair, you've never actually realised it. You were born 3-0 up, and you think you scored a hat-trick. Someone comes along and says, we're going to give them a couple of goals as well. You'll still be 3-2 ahead. But you think that's grossly unfair. Why are they getting given two goals when I'm not being given any? 
That's absolutely outrageous. That's positive discrimination, that is. That's social engineering. It's disgusting. It's, 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 it's woke blobness gone mad. But entitlement is fascinating. And I can't believe we've been having conversations about class for 20 years. And it's taken Keir Starmer, of all people, to drive home that it's often about a state of mind rather than a state of being. So I'm not beating myself up completely because we've talked a hell of a lot about cap doffing and, and deference, but I've always done it from a place perhaps of arrogance. And I marvel at how decent people can think that Jacob Rees-Mogg gives a flying fig about their interests or their children's future. And I talk about deference, doff cap, tug forelock, vote Rees-Mogg. That's working class. That sentiment that these people are your betters. That's what he's talking about. And if you've got entitlement, you've got no idea. Sarah, in a, in a text, describes it as the ignorance of entitlement. And it's something that I, I, you're very lucky to break out of. To realise that you were born one nil up or two nil up or three nil up. Shouldn't be hard, should it? Because you could just point at someone over there who was born 20 nil up and realise that there's people over there born 4 nil down. And it is the job of politics to level that playing field, says Keir Starmer. I love this. Listen again to the... Actually, no, I'll, I'll come back and do it in a minute. I'm already a bit late. But what I'm going to do is ask you about the moments where you have felt or you have heard that voice in the back of your head. Because I thought... It's a bit, it's nothing, nothing more funny, is there, than a public school-educated middle-class journalist claiming that he has working-class roots. So I shall spare you that. I don't. Also, it upsets my mum. I categorically don't, albeit that four generations ago, perhaps, I might have done. Um, I can hear my mum in my voice now saying, your great-granddad played the flute for Queen Victoria, but I don't know whether that's supposed to prove that we were middle class or just whether my great-granddad was a brilliant flautist. I've got another one who played cricket for Yorkshire. But the, the, point, the point, of course, is that voice. You think you've got that voice in the back of your head telling you that, but I, he's talking about something quite specific and particular. And I want to try and hear that voice. I want to know what that voice is that makes somebody working class. 